OK, right. So today's talk is not going to be about pretty Haskell or what monads are or how to use functors and applicatives and everything. There are tons and tons of other talks there um, for that. Lots of good material. Today what we'll do is we will use Haskell for what people tend to call dirty stuff, like you know, um, serving an API, talking to Cassandra, and notifying Kafka. Um, the real-world things that people tend to use other languages for. I mean, how many of you use, I don't know, .NET for APIs? Okay. This used to be a purely .NET conference, so that's kind of expected. OK, right. Let's talk about, say, Scala, Go, Rust. Who uses Scala? OK, I do, quite a lot. Go? A bit less than I expected, but yeah. Rust? Probably no one. Oh. One person. Cool. Um, uh, the thing is that um, while we're on Scala, uh, or I do a lot of work on Scala, as I do with Python and some of the, uh, other stuff, but I use, uh, we use Scala for a lot of functional programming and Im implementing the functional paradigm on the JVM. That's not because of the JVM, but in spite of the JVM in many cases. If only we had some language that was like functional, like Scala, but didn't need the JVM. Uh, in terms of Go, we hear, okay, Go doesn't have generics, it, uh, it has all these cool things, but it doesn't have generics, and it's a, in some cases it's a pain to work with, other people really like Go. But if only Go could do generics and still generate native code. Similarly, Rust can do generics, can do native code, but it's very new, it's not mature yet. If only there was this language that was functional and compiled to native code and was fast, and was mature and had years and years of you know, research um, behind it and libraries getting built over the years. And that's kind of what Haskell is. People tend to overlook Haskell as an academic language. And it has its roots in academia, yes, but as we go along over the last few years, tools have developed considerably well and libraries have matured so that you can actually do some pretty useful things with Haskell. So we'll look at some of those today. Okay. For that, uh, quick question, why do we have a compiler? What does a compiler give us that, say, an interpreter doesn't? Runtime speed, OK? So it compiles down to native code, and then you, or something that performs well, then you um, get a performance boost. What else could, does a compiler do that an interpreter can't? Sorry? Really good linting. Yes, it can do error checking. It can tell us when we get something wrong. Okay? It can verify our programs for us to a certain extent. Um, if you think about how we plug that gap in other languages, say in JavaScript, among other things, uh, I write a lot of JavaScript, I <laughs> yeah. um, is that we, we plug that gap by writing lots of unit tests or integration tests or a lot of other tests. Now, we're not saying that a compiler can actually take away all these requirements of testing, but a lot of the cases where you would have to explicitly write tests for a proper, good, robust time, uh, type system um, built in a language that honors type systems and verifies it for you can reduce the need for the amount of testing that you do, and then you can shift your focus to testing the things that actually matter. And while we're on the topic of tests, we won't go look at it today, but Haskell kind of brought up the idea of things like quick check that kind of goes and finds test cases for you based on um, specific definitions. So if you have a function that works on some integers uh, and produces some results, Haskell will go in and automatically, or quick check, will go and automatically generate test cases that are likely edge cases, like zero and negative numbers and positive numbers uh, within specific parameters, and take those parameters and run um, your tests against them. So when you are actually, when you do see that you do need to write some tests, testing in Haskell actually becomes easier than testing in other languages, in many cases. Um, and quick check frameworks have, have been developed for other platforms now. Erlang has um, a similar, Scala has Scala check and um, other things. But um, one of the key things um, that, say, Haskell and the functional par paradigm gives you is kind of bulletproof abstraction. If an abstraction is, is in place, it won't let you cheat. It won't let you wiggle your way and do some sort of typecasting to uh, make your model break your abstraction. So the abstractions you put in place, they are kind of there. This talk is not about that, but um, 
the key thing is that once you learn Haskell, and this happened to me back in 2011-12, is that once you um, learn Haskell and the functional paradigm, it changes the way you think about programming. Um, previously, before libraries and tools mature for Haskell, what people used to say was that you should learn Haskell because it will ch make you a better programmer in the language that you program for. And that still holds true. But now what you can do is you can actually, actually code uh, right natively inside of Haskell. Okay. Right, so today we'll mostly be looking at code and lots of Git commits. I won't take the risk of light co live coding because um, if something goes wrong and a compiler error comes up, then we could spend 40 minutes trying to make it compile. There's a running joke in Haskell is that uh, if you can get your program to compile, it'll probably run fine. Okay. Um, the main thing you're trying to get away from is runtime exceptions, runtime errors, and you're trying to capture those things at compile time so the compiler can verify it for you. Okay. Right, so the first tool um, that is becoming standard uh, in the Haskell tool, tool chain is called Stack. So Stack is like a, oopsie, um, Stack is like a command line tool that can do a lot of things. It can um, scaffold out a new project for you. It can run builds, run tests. It can do code coverage. It can do a whole lot of things. And all of that is integrated into a uh, single binary. It's available on different platforms. But at its simplest, what you do is you basically go stack, and then you give it a command. Can everybody see that? OK. So the first uh, command is basically stack templates. And that tells you a list of templates that you actually have installed. And you can see a lot of templates are provided out of the box. Okay? Uh, foundation is one, JCJS. So this one's kind of interesting, because what it does is it takes your Haskell code and comp it transpiles it down to JavaScript, so you can run it on the browser. Um, this is something that's happening more and more. Uh, things like PureScript, Elm, and other languages are taking Haskell's concepts and functional paradigms and making that available as a language that then compiles down to JavaScript. Haskell itself can compile down to JavaScript. Um, right. And basically, there's a lot of uh, templates. There's simple, simple HPAC that enables HPAC things. We'll talk about that briefly. Uh, Yesod is a web framework. Spock is a web framework. So the idea is that you can create a new project. And um, uh, uh, yeah, you can create a new project that will have the directory structure and a basic starter kit. Um, with the dependencies preset up for different types of applications. Okay. Um, so the template we'll use is the most basic template, which is called new template, which is the default. So what you basically do is go st stack new project name, and then you can give it a template name if you want. Otherwise, you use a new template. Uh, you go into that directory, you run stack build, and you run um, stack exec. That will take your uh, scaffold a new project, build it, and run it. Okay. So here, what I'm doing is I will basically go get checkout. Step one, and what I have there is the result of running that particular command. Okay. What that gives us is a folder with your project name. Um, Ignore the stack work. That's stack's kind of temporary work location. That's not something you, you check out. Uh, it gives you an app folder, a source, source folder with a lib file. It gives you a test folder, if you're into testing, with an empty file. Well, not empty. It's starter for test. That's not really doing much. Um, let's use the size of this. And look at that. Uh, okay, so that's basically a test that doesn't do anything. But um, it gives you a file where you can put your dependencies on. So if you're in .NET, what package.json was before they killed it off. Um, this is kind of similar. Uh, follows more like a YAML type syntax or Cabal syntax. Um, and you have a stack.yaml, which defines your environment. So Cabal files define projects. The, so you, for different projects, you might have different Cabal files, whereas uh, for stack.yaml, you have something that um, describes your whole environment. But let's say we have this. If we do have this, what can we do with this? What we do with this is we can go into source. Okay. And we can go into the project folder, and we can do stack build. 
and it's built, and we can do stack exec AUH exe. OK. So what we'll do is we'll go through the first things, we'll, we'll go slowly and describe little bits of detail. As we progress, we'll speed up considerably. OK. So what's that doing? If we look at our main, Our main is simply importing our lib, which is a module we're exporting, and calling a function. So we're saying main is something that produces some sort of side effect. IO is kind of special. Uh, so in Haskell, this is a type signature. The first line uh, defines what main is. Everything in Haskell is a function. Main itself is a function. Okay. Um, so what uh, this is saying is that this is a function that creates a side effect and doesn't return anything. Okay. And we're saying main is some func. Where does some func come from? It comes from lib. What we're saying here is that the name of our module is lib, which is exporting a function called some func. Okay. And what does it do? It calls this function, function put strlen, or puts that string as a line on the console. Okay. Now, the reason this is a function that's returning a, an IO is that this thing doesn't actually necessarily have a return value. This, this thing itself doesn't do anything. It's a computation. When you execute that computation, that's when the side effect happens. We're not returning anything from this. That's why this bit here is empty. Right? And what IO is effectively saying is that I am something that is doing something to the real world. So IO is a special type in Haskell. Okay. So questions? Okay, we haven't really got started there. But. <laughs> okay, so now let's start doing the cool stuff. Let's add some dependencies. Okay, and um, I should mention that um, going forward, or of the tools available, HPack is something you'd probably want to use. HPack uh, makes managing dependencies, um, inter project dependencies, much more simpler. Um, it can basically, in a, from a single file, it can detect what dependencies you have and then goes and generates the cabal files for you. Um, the, the cabal files themselves could be uh, kind of repeti repetitive. You might have to manage them manually, which gets to be a pain. HPack takes care of that. The, uh, there are templates like simple HPack, the one I mentioned. Uh, going forward, the default new template is going to uh, have um, uh, HPack built in. In fact, it had before they switched, uh, did a revert eight days ago. So the first time I created the slides for this talk, HPack was there. And then suddenly yesterday when I ran it, HPack was not there. That was fun. Um, so without HPack, what you do is you go into your Cabal file, and then you add the dependencies. So what does, what does that look like? Um, we go into our Cabal file, and then we are saying that that would be step two. There we go. Right? So in this section, we have uh, a place that says library. And that library is expo uh, exposing our lib module, and that happens to have a dependency on these libraries. What I've done is, for all the steps that we're going to do through the demos, basically put them all together in this place. So um, guess what the Haskell Works Kafka client does? No guesses? OK. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a Kafka client. Byte string, these are, these are all kind of um, useful. The headline ones are here, um, for today are Kafka client, Scotty. Scotty is the API framework we're going to be using. Uh, Eason does JSON. CQL.io CQL is for connecting to Cassandra. Okay. Um, so this file is where you list dependencies, very much similar to how you would list dependencies in your package JSON file. Okay. Um, right. So oh, it's the problem of working on a 4 4K screen and then having a very low <laughs> resolution <laughs> display. Okay. Um, now, all of, the, all of the dependencies we mentioned, pretty much all of them are coming from the official stackage repositories that we've referenced. If you have something that is not in the official stackage one, you have to mention them in stack YAML as part of extra depths. The only one that we're going to be using today that is not there is the Kafka client. Maybe it will eventually be there. Who knows? OK, um, so with the dependencies added, the next thing we'll do is create a very simple model. And 
let's have a look at what that looks like. It's easier to see in VS Code. Okay. Right. So the key thing here is this little bit. Okay, that's how you define a data type and a constructor for that data type in Haskell. Okay. The to-do here represents a data type, and the to-do here represents a fun well, kind of like a function that can create an instance of that data type. Okay. Um, I won't go into the details of what all of this means. Effectively, what this is saying is that this is a record type that has two properties, an ID, which is text, and a description that is text. Driving show means that it automatically generates a kind of two-string-like method for you, and generic means that it, it automatically can do some sort of generic handling. Not going into the details of that either. Um, instance to JSON and from JSON effectively means that the compiler and uh, the ESON framework is doing some magic that lets you convert this to JSON and uh, read it back out of JSON. Okay. That's your serialization and deserialization right there. Okay. Lastly, what I've done, and there are other libraries to do this, but I'm doing it manually, is that I'm declaring a function called todo that takes a tuple of two parameters and is returning a record of todo. Okay. Just a helper function, so that instead of uh, specifying this type of you know, slightly more verbose representation, I can just go to do and give it a tuple of two elements. Um, similarly, I'm doing another one that basically takes uh, an instance of that record and gives me back a tuple. This, will, this is going to be useful when we uh, interact with Cassandra. Okay. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, so that's our model. Questions about the model? Yeah. They're optional. Yes, so the, the Haskell compiler is really good. It's really powerful. It's much more powerful than um, what Scholar can do. In the majority of cases, the Haskell compiler will simply infer the types for you. Okay. In certain cases, as we'll see later on, the compiler cannot do that, and you have to give it hints. Um, there are some, uh, th there's some benefits to providing explicit formal type declarations for your public functions. Okay. Um, perhaps when you're you know, describing an API or building a library that other people are going to use. So it can be a good idea to have your um, type declarations or type annotations there, but they're by no means a necessity. And the other thing that the Haskell compiler does is it automatically, if it has to derive it, it automatically derives to the most generic version possible. Okay. It doesn't assume any sort of constraints if it, if it can do that. So your functions will work for any types that support the operations that are available. Um, if you want to constrain that, then you can add an explicit type declaration that is non-generic, and that, that would serve as constraints. So type de declarations, uh, there are two use cases. One is that um, you're providing it for hints to other developers, and the other reason is to, well, three reasons. Uh, the other reason is to help the compiler in cases where it can't figure it out. And the third case is where you want to constrain it down from a completely gen generic version to a more specific thing. So you can say that this function only works on decimals, but it doesn't work on ints, or only works on ints and not on decimals. For those types of things, you constrain it by providing the uh, type definition. Uh, if you don't have those constraints, up to you. Like, we don't have one. It compiles, it builds. Okay. Uh, right. So, yeah, so this is one of the things that say um, HPAC, as I mentioned, if you have an exposed uh, in your uh, or this module exposes this in your uh, code file, HPAC can go and automatically add it um, to your cabal, because the cabal files are generated from uh, your code. Uh, if not, you have to go and explicitly say which ones you're going to expose. That's one reason to use HPAC, among many. Okay. Um, next, what we're doing is um, in our lib function, where we had some func, that basically said something. Instead of that, what we're doing is instead of put, uh, put, um, put string, I'll just call it put string. Um, put string some string, what we're doing is show. Show is basically two string in Haskell. Okay. Show anything means that convert it to a string and display it. Um, so what we're doing here is that this is how you call functions in Haskell with a space. 
there's no brackets for calling functions. Uh, this, these brackets are for creating the tuple, not, not for calling the function. Okay. Um, so we're creating an instance of to-do by passing it a tuple of something and description of something. Uh, dollar means compute the thing on the right and pass it to the function on the left. Okay. So we're taking the to-do, converting it to a string, and passing it to a string. Yeah, just chaining things together. It's kind of like F-sharp, just F-sharp's pipe, just going in the opposite direction. Instead of top down, it goes bottom up. Okay. Um, and that's basically it. So we have um, a module that's giving us a data structure, and we're printing it. That's, that's still not very useful. Um, we're about halfway through, so I'm not going to run that. There are more interesting things to run. Okay. Questions on that? It's very simple stuff, right? I mean, yeah, the syntax is slightly different. It's a new language to m people who are not familiar with Haskell. Yep. Uh, yeah, um, there are ways of doing it. So there are various operators. Dot, for example, would compose two functions together, and you'd d create your function chain with dots, and, uh, and then at the end, just pass the thing you want to pass. And you can do it that way as well. Ah, yes. So, uh, one of Haskell's warts is that there are various different types of strings. Overloaded strings means that you can kind of, look, uh, if, you, if you have string literals, by default, this would be interpreted as a correct character array. If you have a function that takes a text, like our to-do constructor takes a text, what overloaded strings does is it tells the compiler that take a, if there's a literal correct character array, then convert that to a text on the fly if a function expects it. Okay. So um, there are a lot of language extensions available in Haskell that carry out various different things. Um, we had, I think we had one in model as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so uh, the one in model, for example, that says derive generic and derive uh, data typable. What that's enabling is that's enabling ESON to automatically do the JSON and serialization, deserialization. Um, in general, there are a lot of these extensions available, but realistically, you'll only need a select few to do most, most of the things that you'd uh, come across. Okay. And if you don't use them, fine. It, it, usually what happens is that they save you some code. Or some li library author expects that feature to be available in order to carry out some operation easily. Right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add an API. So what does that look like? Step four, added an API. Right. So, this is our main, right? Where we had, uh, where we're calling out to some func. So instead of calling out to some func, what we do is we call out to Scotty, mention a port, and give it this thing called roots. And in roots, what we do is we say, forget to this root, return a text representation of this. Text is a Scotty type, or a Scotty function. Um, similarly, for this, what we're saying is for hello with name extract. So this is a do block in Haskell. What a do block lets you do is it's kind of syntactic sugar across a series of function chains to say, you know, be extremely simple. Um, but what it lets you do is it lets you extract um, some value out of some comp uh, computation. So if you're running something that represents a, a future or a task or something asynchronous, or if, you're, if you've got something that may be a value or it might be null, um, there are these uh, abstractions for, for that, these types of comp computations that return a value when, they, when they're carried out. What, it, um, what this is doing is it's saying extract the result of that computation. So in this case, param represents a computation that if you give it a string, it matches that with the query string and returns you that value. Okay. How it's working internally may be more complicated. But I mean, you guys have written APIs. Does that look difficult? Right. Would you be able to get a .NET API up and running that takes a parameter and returns this? This is literally the amount of code you need. You, um, the model, model stuff we did, the lib stuff, you don't need any of that. This, this gives you an API. Right. This is shorter, more terse than, well, .NET obviously, most 
pretty much all Java frameworks, um, and even some Python APIs. And Python has some very, very concise APIs. Okay. Or by APIs, I mean API frameworks. Anyhow, so let's actually see that, um, how that works. Okay. So again, we basically do stack build. And stack exec. Oh, the binary is creating is called auh-exe. That's why I'm holding it. That, um, executable happens to be in one of the build folders. So I, can, I could have gone in there and just run it. Okay. Oh, it's actually already running on port 3000. Oh, dear Lord, I'm, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> right. Um, and then if I go to localhost 3000 slash hello, it tells me hello. If I go to localhost hello James, it tells me hello James. Okay, simple as that. Um, apart from the talking, that's basically a two-minute operation from zero to having an API. Okay. Right. So, what's our next step? Questions on the API? Yeah. No. Um, yeah, uh, there, there might be. I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, you, could, you can use watch to just recompile on the fly. Um, but um, stack may support it. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Right, so that's, a, that's an API. Let's, let's talk about doing something useful. And this, uh, running joke about Haskell, and it's, it's not mine. Simon Peyton Jones, for example, <laughs> mentions it a lot of time. The problem with Haskell is that it's a useless language. It's got um, you know, mathematical abstractions and this connecting to that, and this can prove that this model is correct or not and everything. But by useful, we mean side effects. Okay? Unless you have side effects, it's not useful. When you say useful, uh, well, sorry, it's, it's useless, it doesn't mean that the language doesn't have value. By useless, we mean that it doesn't do side effects. So what's happened over the last uh, couple of years is that these libraries and frameworks have been built so that we can take advantage of more side effects. And by side effects, we mean doing things like random numbers or um, you know, uh, talking to databases, writing data, uh, files out, um, interacting with an HTTP server, things where um, you connect to the real world. Okay. Uh, in domain-driven design terms, not, not your core doma domain, but the, but the ports and adapters around um, uh, your system. So what we'll do now is basically look at the side effects. So the first side effect we'll look at is um, something that basically gives you the current time. Can everybody see that? So it's fairly small. Uh, you know what? Let's, let's try looking at it from VS Code. OK. Right. So here what we have is our function. That's what's the time. And previously we had IO of empty. Now we have IO of string. Okay. And it's using a system function called get current time. And what we're doing is we're extracting the time from get current time and returning a string that is the concatenation of the time is now that. Okay. The reason this has side effects is because this is going to change. Uh, a pure function is something that gives you exactly, the, given the same inputs, it always gives you the, exactly the same outputs. This function takes no inputs, and it returns you a different value every single time. So this is not a pure function. This has side effects. And the way we, Haskell gets around the um, you know, constraints of being able to um, you know, reason about types and prove if something is going to error or not is that the difference between this returning a string and an IO of string is that this means this has a side effect. Okay. If you were to use it in a context that didn't expect a side effect, it will be a comp compilation failure. It won't be a runtime failure. Okay. Um, and going to main, we can see using it is fairly simple. Just a brief note about lift IO. Well, what that does is that these computational results with side effects, different side effects work in different ways. Um, lift IO, it's overly simplifying it a bit, but it kind of makes it from one context to another. So for example, um, what we're getting from what's the time is an IO of a string, and to make it work with Scotty's expectation of a side effect, we use the lift IO function. Okay. And previously, we mentioned that uh, overloaded strings takes a literal and converts it to a text on the fly. 
Um, if you don't have a literal, as in a string within quotes, in your source, source code, if you have a variable, then overloaded strings can't do that. For that, you need a function called from string. That's what's going on there. Yeah. OK, so that's how we deal with, say, side effects from Scotty, from the API. Um, the next thing we look at is Cassandra. How many of you used Cassandra? OK, a few, uh, a few people. It's similar to, say, SQL Server in some aspects. Yeah, no. Um, the querying style is a subset of that, but um, the way you query it is, is basically that. You go select this from this table. Okay. And we have a database up and running that uh, has those, but let's look at the code first, and then we can go to that. Right, so function for DB. Uh, what the first thing is doing is letting you connect. Won't go into the details of that. Um, and this is basically a helper. The way you run queries on Cassandra is you go run client, you go to Cassandra client, you give it a query string, and you give it parameters. Okay. If you were to do database access in pretty much every other platform, you do something similar um, with slightly different syntax. What's interesting is how we can use it. So for example, if I were to get a full list of to-dos, from a database, you've seen the data structure to do, ID description, consider there's a table of that sitting in Cassandra, which there is. Um, it could be SQL Server, it could be anything. Okay. But the way we use the library is that we give it a query string, select ID description from to-dos, and we tell, and this is where we have to help the compiler, because we've just given it a string. The compiler can't know that the string represents something to access Cassandra or something else. So the way this library works is that it expects you to take that string and give it a type of query string you specify whether this is a read or a write by going R or W. You tell it what type of parameters you give it, as in what the input parameters are. In this case, we're just getting them all, so we don't have any parameters. And you, expect, uh, you tell it what the result type is. And in this case, it's a list of tuples, okay. ID and description. Then you call it by giving it the parameters. We don't have any parameters here. And this is our clients that we're passing in uh, when calling the function. Okay. Um, these are various different ways of calling it. So get to do's and get to do's two will do the same thing. This is using a uh, kind of operator type syntax, and this is using a uh, you know um, a do block. The end result of both are effectively the same. Um, Haskell has many operators available to make your code look nicer or more confusing, depending on who you ask. Um, some are common. So for example, dollar means take the thing on the right and pass it to the function on the left. Um, the uh, dollar with the brackets means take the computation on the right, extract the results, and pass it to the function on the left. In this case, the function happens to be a map to do. So to do was a function. What we're saying is map of to do is if you have a list of things, take each of them, and then call to do on each of them, and give us the result. It's like select in, in C sharp. Um, is it select? Yes, it, it is select. Um, right, and, and so because we're not providing it with another parameter, what this is basically saying is that this is, this in its totality, it, it, it's a function query. It's expecting a list of things on, on the right. Now, we have a function that expects a list of things that it can convert to a to-do, but we have a computation that results in a list of things that each need to be converted to a to-do, and, and so we use this operator here. The same thing can be done in the do block, but this is going to Haskell syntax and um, details. Um, the way you do um, updates is very similar. Um, so here what we're doing is, let's get a bit more of screen space. Ooh, that's a lot of screen space. Okay. Um, we're basically doing something similar. We're giving it a query string. Where we're saying insert into to-do's values. This is the Cassandra syntax for representing parameters. Okay. And we're saying that this is going to be a write. The input is going to be a tuple of two texts. Um, and the result is going to be empty, and we're going to give it items. Okay. Um, how many of you use dapper.net to query SQL Server databases? Pretty much more or less everybody, right? This is kind of similar, right? Just with type annotations to make it more constrained. If, if it doesn't pass type checks, it's not going to compile, not, you know, fail at runtime, if you will. 
Um, it's, it, it's interesting that. So, for example, this is returning a list of things. However, get to do, which takes a single parameter as in the identifier, if you look at the query, it's where id equals something, right? That does not return you one to do. It returns you a maybe of a to do, which means that it can give you a result or it can give you a failure. Okay? The fact that um, that id may or may not match is encapsulated within the library to ensure that it gives you, either it gives you something, or it, or it gives you a specific thing saying that nothing was found. It's not going to store an exception, and it's not going to uh, conflate that into a list and give you a list of one item or zero items. So you don't have to do that sort of checking yourself. Yep. 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 Yeah, because the return type of these functions are IO. OK? Of course, if you're handling the I.O. yourself, then you, you... So this isn't the type signature of this. If we were to expand that out, I don't know if it does. Yes, it does. Um, or it doesn't, not for that one anyway. <laughs> so the type signature for this is not a list of to-do. It's an I.O. of a list of to-do. Okay. Similarly, the type signature of get to-do is not a maybe of a um, to-do. It's an I.O. of a maybe of a to-do. So the fact that it can fail at runtime is encapsulated by the I.O. Okay. Um, right, we've got three minutes left, so I think we've just got enough time to actually finish stuff. Um, the way we use this is kind of similar. Let's go to main. Right. Uh, again, very simple. Only this time, if you look at our roots definition, we're also taking the Cassandra client. And so we're saying connect, lift IO connect, that gives us a client, and we're passing in C to roots and passing that thing to Scotty3000. Um, and the fact that it works is we can go to localhost 3000 slash to do's. Ah. And we don't see anything because I'm not actually running it, am I? <laughs> right, where did that go? Stack build. Oh, uh, stack, exec, ah dash exe. And there you go. Okay. And these are the ones we have the database. If you do slash one, it works. Okay. I won't go into the put demo because I'll need to spin up what's it called, um, Postman. And it works, trust me. Yeah, you can check out the code. <laughs> it compiles, it has to work. Um, <laughs> um, actually, while I was preparing the demo, I ran into that. The biggest challenge was getting it to compile, not actually testing and verifying whether it's working or not. Okay. Uh, and the last thing we will look at today in two minutes is how we notify Kafka. Stop that. Step seven. Um, and for this, we have the HW Kafka client. There are more wrappers around this, like Conduit. Um, but in essence, that's basically what it is. So here what we're saying is that you're initializing a Kafka consumer, or sorry, producer, by giving it a bunch of producer props. What do they look like? They look like a broker list where you can give it a bunch of addresses and you set the log level. You give it a topic name. Actually, you give, don't give it a topic name. Uh, you can use the same client to publish the different topics. Um, so this initializes your connection and this closes your connection. That's important for Kafka because if there's a, that's a graceful shutdown. Um, although it's not necessary, if you just suddenly disconnect yourself, then uh, Kafka takes some time to kick you out, which isn't necessarily the greatest thing. But the way you produce a message is we go produce message Kafka record where record equals this. Now we could have actually um, done something like let record equals here and then call it. This is just another variant of Haskell syntax, which follows very much from mathematics, where you go, you can define a function body and then go where and then define its components. So your code looks quite nice. Okay. Um, the other thing we have here is that in main, we're doing slightly more, is that you can see in all of these, we're simply going record, giving it a topic name and going, giving the string. So whenever these functions are called, a message appears on Kafka. OK? 
Okay. Uh, the way we set this up is slightly more, uh, a lot more complicated because we have to um, kind of ensure that when we're shutting down, we release the Kafka um, client gracefully. Open, do your main operation, and then shut down. Okay. Um, the main operation here in this case is exactly the same as before. We can see something we can see that you can see that uh, what we get here is that we're getting our audit or the Kafka client and uh, Cassandra, and we're saying is that if we get a successful result from our initialization, that's where the case A of right audit means, as in if the thing is actually correct. Uh, then we call Scotty3000 with our roots Cassandra client and audit. Otherwise, we just return immediately. We could do something like notifying the, or throwing a, not throwing an exception, that's already an error case. Okay. Um, so we need the setup because of Kafka, not necessarily for Cassandra. Cassandra can just uh, die immediately. So what does that look like when it's working? Um, Let's build it. Slightly over time. And if we run it, okay. And from here, we can basically, okay, let's have a look at which ones actually have orders on them. So hello doesn't, but hello, hello a name does. So. If I say, hello, James, then that took, uh, I did, hard to notice, but took slightly longer than it, than it did the first time we did this. Okay. Um, and the way we can check whether it's working or not is here, we're going into our Kafka container, and we're going into the bin folder, and we can have a Kafka cons console consumer running from beginning, and we can see um, these are the Kafka messages that are appearing. Um, so let's have a, someone give me a name. I don't know. Sorry, Ruth, right? Okay, Ruth, why not? I don't know. <laughs> it probably wasn't Ruth, but yeah, there you go. Uh, it's in Kafka, right? So you got um, connectivity with Kafka, Cassandra, um, using an API that's doing basic forms of error handling, doing proper initialization and setup um, fairly easily, right? Um, and that's basically it. So the slides are available there, the code's available there. If you're looking at Haskell, um, the, the key benefits of Haskell are not necessarily these. The benefits are the approval models and the strong type system and everything else. To take advantage of that, there are tons of other resources of, uh, on Haskell. Ha Haskellbook.com is probably the best resource on Haskell currently other. Okay. Uh, people talk about other books like Learn Your Haskell and lots of other things, and they're good in various different ways, but if you're actually looking to make production quality applications um, and what patterns are most commonly used, uh, Christopher Allen's book is probably the best thing that there is. Okay. Um, and the thing is that, um, you know, you can use this. Um, uh, the stack tool we talked about, uh, where'd that go? The stack tool we talked about, it, it has a lot of features. It can do things like um, uh, building inside of Docker containers. And the benefit of that, Haskell uh, compiles to native. So for different platforms, you'll create different binaries if you create multi-platform binaries. So you can uh, initiate builds in different Docker containers for the different platform, build them, and then distribute them. Uh, it can package things up, so things like tra Travis CI integration, code coverage, uh, shell auto-completion, Nix integration, compiling to JavaScript, all of these things are uh, kind of actually managed by Stack very easily. It's, it's not hard to do. Previously, you'd have to set all these things up manually yourself, and that's what made it difficult. But now the tools are there. So uh, you can actually take your things, put it into Docker containers, and deploy for production applications and whatnot. You, you've got an API with microservices and everything else. It's, you know, whether, whether you're doing REST or not REST or RPC, doesn't really matter. It's, it's all connecting through a network. So if you're deploying via Docker, 
just experiment with the next API you're going to build, or next microservice. Try it in Haskell and see if you like it. Right? It's extremely simple to do. Anyhow, that's it. If you guys have you know, more questions, I'll be around. If you came to my deep learning talk yesterday, I forgot to mention, if you have any questions whatsoever, just come talk to me. Okay. Thank you.